We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and go verse by verse. And the topic is going to be sin problems. And the first sin we're going to look at is fornication. 1 Corinthians 5.1 says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So, in the days we are living in, you don't hear the word fornication much. Many people make light of this sin, so they're not going to say words like fornication. They're going to say things like, we're going to go home and watch Netflix and chill. And yeah, that is a common saying people use when they're going to go fornicate. And that is a common saying people say today when they're going to do something that they shouldn't do with someone they're not married to. They say they're going to go have a one-night stand. They say they're going to go get laid tonight. You know, things like this to kind of smooth over this sin, make it not look so bad. However, what they don't know is that when they fornicate, commit a sexual act with someone that they aren't married to, that they are opening themselves up to devilish spirits. But this man here in 1 Corinthians 5 is fornicating with his father's wife. Not only is the boy wicked, but the woman is also wicked. She would be what they call a cougar or the very vulgar slang term that people use so so easily today, the word MILF. That's a very vulgar slang term people use. And those are nothing but wicked women who never grew up. But do you wonder what's wrong with the young ladies today? It's that the mothers still act like teenagers. And they get labeled these vulgar slang terms. But this safe man here that fornicated is what the Bible calls a whoremonger. And I, in Hebrews 13.4... It says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Not only is he a whoremonger, but he is also a backstabber, an unloyal and rebellious son. He is taking another man's wife. To top it off, it's his father's wife. It's like the Lord said to Abimelech when he almost laid with Abraham's wife. The Lord said, thou art but a dead man. So if you take or you know flirt with another man's wife you're walking on dangerous ground and god just may take your head off for it but you see this whoremonger here this young man laid with his father's wife and it's fornication it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you as paul said and that's just one of the sins we need to put away if you're got that in your life whether you're physically committing the act or you're doing it in your mind through digital fornication, pornography, you need to put these things away from you. And the next one we're going to look at is pride. 1 Corinthians 5 2 says, And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. So the Corinthians are puffed up with their knowledge, their false gifts, and whatnot. They haven't done any weeping over this saint getting mixed up into sin. They aren't concerned that he's still hanging around, you know, the sinners and might possibly rub off on them. And Paul says they should take away from among them. So there is a time to separate from another person, maybe even another Christian. 1 Corinthians 5.3 says, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. So Paul isn't there in body, but in spirit. And he has already made his mind up about the situation. And he says in verse 4 and 5, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So notice how serious he is saying, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, the man who committed fornication should be delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And I was at, I was at a weird holiness church once, and the preacher said, the devil can't hurt any of you if you're saved. And I'm thinking, this guy must not have ever read 1 Corinthians 5. Because in 1 Corinthians 5, you have a saved man committing fornication 
and was delivered to Satan for destruction of the flesh. And that sounds like the devil is going to hurt him to me. I don't know about you. But this also goes to show that in the sense of your physical body, a Christian can be devil-possessed. In the sense of your physical flesh, the devil can't get your soul. He can't get your salvation. But he can have everything else. He can have you on the ground with boils on you. He can have you on the ground begging God for mercy. And this is a deterrent to sin in the life of a Christian. Now, a Christian can't be devil-possessed in the sense that the devil gets his soul. But he can get your body. Notice 1 Corinthians 5, 5, To deliver such an one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The day of the Lord Jesus, referring to the judgment seat of Christ, where saints are judged, his flesh would see destruction, but his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He would still meet the Lord in the air at the rapture and go to the judgment seat of Christ. But the word saved here refers to his testimony as a Christian. If he is delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, then he may get right and fix things up. And this way he'll he'll come out better at the judgment seat of Christ. Or if he dies early, his testimony won't be as bad because he won't live longer to further ruin it. God's going to take him out so that he can't further put shame to his own name and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But people just can't get it down that a Christian has two natures. They can't get it down that a man's flesh isn't born again. They can't get it down that we are at war with the flesh and that a Christian is capable of being a perverted, fornicating backstabber like this guy. But this guy doesn't die. He gets right with the Lord. As you can see in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8, it says, But if any have caused grief, he that not grieve, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many so that contrary wise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow wherefore i beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him for to this end also did i write that i might know the proof of you whether you be obedient in all things to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So you see the Corinthians, this man is restored. The Corinthians forgive him, and he's, he repented. Now, back to 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Their glorying is not good. Why did they think they were so good if they were allowing incest in their local church? And Matthew 6, Matthew 16 and verse 6 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And then in verse 11 it says, How is it that you did not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So, just like a little bad doctrine can mess up everything, one person sinning in your local assembly can cause more sin. So, Paul says, purge out the old leaven. He wants them to kick the guy out at least until he gets right. So, verse 7 in 1 Corinthians 5, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So Christ is our Passover lamb, just like the children of Israel had the Passover in Exodus 12. They put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost and on the lintel. And he had to be a lamb without blemish, roasted with fire and no water. Picturing Jesus Christ taking our hell on the cross because he is our lamb. As it says in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And during the Passover in Exodus 12, 15, they were to put leaven 
out of their houses. Seven days they were to eat unleavened bread. So that's what that's talking about. Now in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And this feast is the Lord's Supper. Leaven is associated with bad doctrine, like in the case of the Pharisees. And in this chapter is associated with sin. So, but, but the unleavened bread is associated with good things. Here it's connected with sincerity and truth. Two marks of a Bible believer. You are sincere and you have the truth and you believe it. That is how you should approach the Bible. Sincerely and willing to accept truth over any false doctrine you may believe. Now verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So Paul talks against the sin of fornication a lot. He talks against the sin of pride a lot. But there was another epistle that God didn't choose to put in the Bible where Paul warned the Corinthians about not companying with fornicators. And then in verse 10 it says, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then you needs go out of the world. For then must you needs go out of the world. Notice he is saying if you had to completely separate yourself then you would have to go out of this world. And this is where a saying comes. A saying comes in that's so true is that a Christian has to be in the world, but not of the world. You're going to have to work with wicked men, but you don't have to act like you're okay with what they say and what they do. You're going to have to live around certain men, but that doesn't mean you should participate in what they're doing. And if you know someone who is involved in wicked sin, I wouldn't make him your best buddy. For example, I've seen good Christian girls who, for some reason, take up with a sodomite, and they go to the mall together and talk about girly stuff together. And that's crazy. It makes it look like you're okay with his sodomite lifestyle. And then you have these guys who just can't enjoy their wife, so they go hang out with the guys all the time, and they have what they call a bromance. And that just doesn't sound right to me anyway. And they hang out with a single guy who tells dirty jokes and cusses and looks at naked women on the internet and everything else. But why would you want to make that your best buddy if you're a Christian? Evil communications corrupt good manners. And I worry about a man who has a good-looking wife at home but would rather hang out with a bunch of smelly guys all the time. That's a little weird. Now, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, which is someone who forces money away from someone, with such an one know not to eat. So you're going to have to be around sinners like these, people with a sin problem. And if you're not careful, their sin problem is going to become your sin problem. You're going to be around Christians who act like lost people. And Paul says here, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous and so on, that's a safe person, then don't eat with him. If you keep hanging out with him, then he's going to make you what they call a wingman at the club or wherever else, and you're going to end up in trouble with the Lord yourself, just like this guy here in 1 Corinthians 5. Now verse 11, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. But you see, it isn't just fornicators. It isn't just people that have a pride problem. It is also the covetous. People who have desires to have something that they shouldn't. It's idolaters, people that worship an idol. And that could be anything. It could be your TV. It could be your music it could be a friend anything that you're putting ahead of god that your idol could be anything and it's also railers we shouldn't company with someone who insults and talks down to people with harsh language paul also mentions drunkards and extortioners if someone is trying to force money out of your pocket maybe through violence or threatening something bad will happen if you don't give it up they say that's extortioners 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.12, For what have I to do to judge them that also are without? This means outside of the church. Do you not judge them that are within the ones inside the church? But them that are without, God judgeth. So the Lord takes care of the ones outside of the church. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it's up to the church to put out that certain wicked person. And it's just, you know, Paul makes it clear through his epistles that we shouldn't company with people that are involved in wicked sin. And that's because the, those sin problems will rub off on us. If you're around fornicators, just hanging around fornicators, that fornication is going to rub off on you. If you're hanging around people that are covetous, their covetousness is going to rub off on you. And another one, complaining. You hang around people that complain, that's going to rub off on you. But this has been verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about the man who committed fornication with his own mother. So just a, an abomination in the sight of God. These sexual sins in the Bible, sodomy, adultery, incest. And we're living in an age where, you know, sexual sins are running rampant. And we need to keep ourselves clean, get our Bible out. If you've got if you're having problems with sexual sins, get your King James Bible out and let it wash you. Let it transform your mind. As Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As it says in the book of Psalms, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You need to get rid of your sin problems, your fornication, your covetousness. And, you know, your sin will go away if you start reading your King James Bible. You're never going to have complete victory over sin. But get out your Bible, read it every day, and pray, and watch your sin problems begin to fade. Because this book will keep you from sin. But this has been 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to focus on the subject of what are Christians. We're going to go through this chapter and see some things that describe a Christian. And number one, a Christian is a judge. 1 Corinthians 6 1 says, There are any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So Paul is saying, how dare you? You ever heard somebody say, how dare you? He's asking how dare they go to the world to get judgment on a matter against another brother in Christ. Why aren't they going before the saints? And you are a saint before death. If you're born again, you are a saint. If you have a matter against another brother, though, get it settled among the saints, not before unbelievers. In 1 Corinthians 6, 2, it says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So the saints, us, we're going to judge the world. So why wouldn't they be able... Why wouldn't we be able to judge the small matters that we have in this life? The saints shall judge the world. What does Paul mean by that? I believe he can be referring to the future millennial time period where saints are going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 2.12, it says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, will, he also will deny us. So if we suffer with the Lord Jesus Christ while we're here, then we're going to have more reign when we get to the kingdom. And the disciples are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The tribulation saints are going to be there too, judging the world. Uh, the saints are going to rule the world one day. Literal heaven on earth. It's not going to be like it is today with all the wicked things you see coming to pass. It's going to be literal heaven on earth during that time. 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So if we're going to judge the world in the millennium, and we're going to judge angels at the great white throne judgment, then we should be able to judge things that pertain to this life. And you heard that right. We will judge angels one day. 
and that's most likely at the great white throne judgment, which takes place after the millennial reign. And we're probably going to judge those angels that sinned. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So those angels have been cast down to hell. Now look at Revelation 20 and verse 13. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up the dead delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works so when hell is delivered up those fallen angels are probably delivered up there too and they'll be judged by saints and saints should be able to judge the small matters that pertain to this life if we're going to be judging angels if we're going to judge the world we should be able to judge these small matters now, 1 Corinthians 6, 4, If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge. <clears throat> set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Why is that? Because the least esteemed in the church would be better judges than any worldly lost man in the judicial system. Also, many times those who are least esteemed in the church are many times wise. Many times they don't have a bias or they're not concerned with their reputation and their high standing among the people being judged but uh, the least esteemed in the church is even better than going to the lost world to be judged first corinthians 6 5 i speak to your shame is it so that there is a not a wise man among you no not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren so paul is shaming the corinthians He's pretty much saying, is there not a man out of all you guys there that can judge this matter? When we should be able to judge the things that pertain to this life, if we're going to judge angels, and if we're going to judge the world, and if we're Christians and got the Holy Spirit in us, is there not a man there that can't judge the things that pertain to this life? Now, 1 Corinthians 6, 6, But brother goeth the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. So that's the main problem. When a brother is arguing with another brother, if he does it before the unbelievers, then he gives them an excuse to blaspheme. He gives them another reason not to be a Christian. And you have these Christian brothers constantly going back and forth on YouTube, yelling at each other, arguing over doctrine. But the lost world is like, this is why I don't want to be a Christian. Now, verse 7. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another, one and up with one another. Uh, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. So he's saying, if a brother does you wrong, then why do you not just take it? Why not just suffer yourself to be defrauded? Then turn him over to the Lord for vengeance instead of trying to get back at him yourself. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. If you are defrauded by a brother, don't take the Lord's vengeance. That's when you're really stealing from God. That is when you take the Lord's vengeance. Let the Lord handle it. But that's what Christians are. We are a judge. And we're also inheritors. So you need to realize once you were born again, you became an inheritor. You didn't inherit salvation. Salvation is a free gift, a present possession. And when you got saved, you became a child of God at that moment. You get the inheritance later. And you are your parent's son now. But you're not going to inherit something from the Lord until later. You have an inheritance reserved in heaven for you. But remembering you don't inherit salvation will help you with the next verses. Remember, salvation is a free gift that you got the moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. So just remember, you don't inherit salvation. And that'll really help you with some tough verses in the Bible, like the one we're about to read here in verse 9, which says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, 
but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus <clears throat> and by the Spirit of our God. And many like to go to these verses here and say, see, if you commit these certain sins, then you lose your salvation. But that isn't what the verse said. It said, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you're saved, you're not unrighteous, and you're not a fornicator, an idolater, or an adulterer, or effeminate, or a drunkard. You may have told a lie since you were saved, but in the sense of your standing before God, you aren't a liar. If you're saved and you've you've told lies, of course, since you've been saved, I'm sure. But your standing before God is sinless just as much as Jesus Christ. Just like you're not any of these descriptions of people described in these verses. You're not a an adulterer in the sense of your standing. Now, there's a difference between your standing and your state. Your state could be an adulterer. Even if you're saved, if you're living for the flesh and you're committing adultery, that's your state. But your standing is always sinless in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll prove that to you because, I mean, you don't believe once you were saved that a lie is going to send you to hell. But look at Revelation 21, 8. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part and the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So all liars are going to have their part in the lake with, that burneth with fire and brimstone, the lake of fire. Now, if our lies are applied to our record after salvation, then everybody's going to hell. That verse said, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So when you got saved, you received imputed righteousness. The Lord gave you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So using 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to prove you can lose your salvation just goes out the window. It's referring to the unrighteous. The unrighteous are obviously lost people who will not inherit the kingdom of God because they're not saved. Now a safe person can lose out on inheritance in the kingdom. If they live for the flesh, they'll still be saved. They'll still go into the kingdom but they forfeit their rule and reign in the millennium. As I said, 2 Timothy 2.12, If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So that's an inheritance. When you get saved, you automatically get an inheritance reserved in heaven for you, but there is also inheritance you earn through works, which has nothing to do with salvation. So 1 Peter 1.4, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you so if you're saved you have an inheritance colossians 3 24 knowing that of the lord you received the reward of the inheritance for you serve the lord christ serving is works the better you serve and the more you serve with the right motive the better your inheritance an inheritance you get the moment you believe the gospel, you get an inheritance. To get more of an inheritance, you get it through works. So, inheritance comes by works. Salvation does not come by works. And you are automatically put into the kingdom of God the moment that you're saved. However, at, at, the, at this time, you can't see the kingdom of God because it's spiritual. As it says in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It is a spiritual kingdom. You can't see it. However, when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom, you will even see the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Both kingdoms will be present because the Lord will be ruling a physical kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God will be seen because you'll have all the saints and glorified bodies walking around. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither the fornicators. That's sexual acts with someone you aren't married to. Nor idolaters, those that worship idols, nor adulterers. A, a person that's married committing sexual acts with someone they aren't married to or a lustful thought towards someone you aren't married to as jesus said 
If you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Nor effeminate men who act like women, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's the sodomite, the homosexual crowd. As Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. 1 Corinthians 6.10-11 through 11, Nor thieves, nor covetous, unlawful. That's someone that's got unlawful desires to have something that isn't theirs. Uh, nor drunkards, nor revilers. Always, those that are always railing and running their mouth, you know, harshly. And, and then it says, nor extortioners. Someone who gets money by force through threats or violence so none of these shall inherit the kingdom of god and such were some of you but ye are washed but ye are sanctified but ye are justified in the name of the lord jesus and by the spirit of our god so the moment you believe the gospel you were no longer any of those things as it says and such were some of you you may still have committed some of those sins after salvation, but Paul said such were some of you. This is because the real you, the new you, the new man, the new creature is sinless and cannot sin. It is our old sinful flesh that we still have that sins. And after salvation, you still have this sinful flesh. As Paul says in Romans seven eighteen, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good i find not so the moment you were saved you were washed sanctified and justified you were sanctified that is set apart you were justified that is declared righteous even though you weren't righteous and you were washed by the blood of the lord jesus christ he washed all your sins away past present and future sins so a saint is a judge a saint is an inheritor and a saint is the temple of the holy ghost in first corinthians six twelve, it says all things are lawful unto me but all things are not expedient all things are lawful for me but i will not be brought under the power of any there are a lot of things that are lawful but they aren't expedient that is they aren't helpful some movies aren't a sin to watch but are you spending all your time watching movies and neglecting your spiritual life? The movies may be lawful, but they aren't expedient. Are you controlled by entertainment? If so, then you have been brought under the power of that. And Paul warns not to be brought under the power of any. In 1 Corinthians 6.13, it says, Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Notice how many times Paul warns against the sin of fornication. And God is going to destroy both the meat and the belly. And the things you can see are temporal things. They aren't eternal. They will be destroyed. This So this means you shouldn't focus all your time and energy on the physical, bodily exercise, profiteth little. The body's going downhill no matter what you do. But the body is not for fornication. Just because you're saved by grace through faith without works, you still have sinful flesh. But this doesn't mean you should yield yourself to be servants to sin. The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So, 1 Corinthians 6.14, And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. When you were saved, your flesh died, and your spirit was quickened. It was raised up, and the body will be raised up at the rapture, and you'll get a new body. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest and most important doctrines in the entire Bible. If the Lord didn't resurrect, then this proves he wasn't God, but was actually just another man like me and you. Now, verse 15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For tooth, saith he, shall be one flesh. So a harlot is what people call today a hoe or a whore. And what Paul is saying is that since your body is for the Lord, Lord's use then why are you joining, joining it in an unlawful relationship to a whore?
Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed and defiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Part of marriage is flesh joining flesh. But this doesn't mean you can you can just join flesh with an harlot. That's fornication. There has to be a vow between a man and a woman. You may be saved, but this doesn't mean you are invincible to reaping and sowing. You'll reap what you sow. And if you sow sexual sins, then you'll reap a bad marriage. You'll reap an early grave. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. If you're a saint, then you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6.17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Look at Romans 7, 4, which says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, you're dead to the law, so that you can marry the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happened when you got saved. 1 Corinthians six eighteen: Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So flee fornication. When you see a strange woman, a woman who acts like a hoe or a slut, which is a good portion of what you see on things like Instagram, Facebook, the magazines, and Hollywood, you need to flee. Run away just like Joseph ran away from Potiphar's wife. Run away like Samson should have run away. Run away like David should have done when he saw Bathsheba. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is for the Lord. It isn't your own. You were purchased by the blood of God. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So you're bought with a price. God purchased you. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you need to glorify God in everything you do. But if you're a saint, you're a judge, you're an inheritor, you're a, a, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that's all we'll talk about it for this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 20. I hope that it's... It's helped you and got you more interested in the Bible. And I just pray you'll start reading the Bible and study.